Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Welcome to Richmond Hill United Methodist Church Easter Sunday morning worship. We are glad that you've joined in for this service and hope that it will be a blessing to you. I want to ask that you will take the time to comment uh, during the service at some point to say good morning or happy Easter or glad to be here. Just let us hear that you're with us online. It's a way to meet and greet one another like we would normally do if we were meeting in person in the building. But since we can't, what a great way to connect. We're so hungry and eager to connect with each other in so many ways that we actually can. So please take the time to do that. It's also sort of a record for us as attendants today, but, but really much more importantly than that is a way to connect with you. Uh, so take the time to do that. Um, it'll bring us joy. Also, another thing that brings us joy is the way that our church has continued to give uh, and to be generous during this time of crisis for our community, for our state, for our nation, uh, for the globe. I mean, just, just all throughout this crisis, our church has continued uh, to be generous and to show their faith uh, the way that they are giving all of us of pull down deep. And I hope that that will be something that we continue to do when we are hearing bad news every day. We, the church, has the best news the new the news of jesus christ the gospel uh, that he is the way and the truth and the life that he goes before us and behind us and walks beside us we have the best news and as you give uh, that helps us continue to share in different ways right here in the community as well as the state and beyond uh, we have secure giving online that you can do you can tap on that and it'll give you straightforward instructions we also still have the option of bringing uh, the mail in we go to the post office and we bring it into the church so uh, thank you for your stewardship is so important let's go to God in prayer as uh, as we worship together gracious God thank you thank you for always being near and present God we ask for a mind that will help us redirect our thoughts when we forget that when we become distracted when we become overwhelmed by the bad news that is in front of us oh God thank you that everything changed because of Easter morning the first Easter morning thank you oh God that death did not win that we can actually say death where is your sting that you are alive and because of that we have life in you Lord we do not discount we do not disregard how much has changed over the last few weeks this morning we acknowledge though with all the changes the thing that has not changed is your grace and your mercy and your redemption and what happened on the cross and what happened on Easter morning when the grave was empty father help us lean into that and press into that so that our faith may be firm we draw strength knowing that you 
or ever with us. Oh God, be glorified in our worship this day. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we pause to just simply acknowledge and cry out to you, coming before you humbly yet earnestly, knowing that you hear each and every prayer, individually and collectively and corporately. Father, as your church, as people across the nation cry out to you in this great time of need right now. Oh God, such grief is happening all over our land. Father, it is heavy. It is overwhelming. It is at times more overwhelming than we want to admit. For so much has changed for so many people in such a short time. And Father, we ask now uh, for the sick and infected that you heal and that you help, that you sustain bodies and spirits. Father, we cry out and ask that you contain the spread of this infection, uh, this virus that is happening. Father, for our vulnerable populations, we ask deliberately and intentionally that you protect our elderly and those already suffering through a chronic disease. Father, help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear of how we can help those uh, who are poor and who are needing help uh, to just have food on their table during this time. As so much has closed down, as finances have dropped for so many, Father, for those who are fearing even losing their jobs or who have lost their jobs already, Father, we cry out and ask that they might have hope and strength and faith that tomorrow shall be a better day. Father, we thank you for the skill sets of all the healthcare workers that are working long hours, that are putting in more than time and a half. Father, we pray for them. We lift up uh, their own personal needs and their own personal concerns about being carrier of that virus back home to their loved ones or to people they come in contact and patients. Father, we thank you for their skill sets. We ask that you uh, grant them wisdom as they are making decisions sometimes in uh, moments notice as new things develop and new protocols happen and new information uh, is coming across. Oh God, we have so much incomplete information from uh, the hospital to the researchers trying to find a vaccine, uh, from the reporters that are on our television and our various devices expressing those information. God, grant us wisdom to how to move in these days and to count our days. Grant us wisdom truly to act and behave wise and mindful of others in a loving and compassionate and caring way, truly displaying Christ-like love. Father, we are your church. We are your children. Help us to have uh, that faith that rises above any anxiety or fear or depression or insecurity that we have, knowing that indeed you carry us, you comfort us, that you are ahead of us, that you strengthen us. Father, strengthen our faith when it wanes and when it, we become weary and we become doubtful. Father, we are so ever grateful that you do not give up on any one of us, that your mercy and your grace is ever so present. Thank you, God. We thank you. We love you. We want to be loving to others. We want to be caring in the way that we behave, that, uh, that we are not careless, so ever mindful and careful. Father, thank you. May we in kind be merciful to others. May we do all that we can to help those in all caring situations, health care, first responders, uh, researchers. Uh, Father, everything that it takes to make our communities strong again, to get past this threat. Oh God, we cry out to you. And what better day to cry out to you on the day that we are reminded that you have overcome the grave, that we can truly say, oh, death, where is your sting? That we can truly say, because he lives, 
I can face tomorrow. Oh God, may we walk in that strength. May we walk in that strength with you, our God, our help, and our healer. Thank you, O oh Father. In Jesus' name, amen. It is Resurrection Sunday, church. It is uh, good for us to be together celebrating Easter today. Uh, I know it still feels really weird. We should be all dressed in our very best and be gathered singing the big songs of the church today. Um, but today, it is what it is. But today is also the very best day. It is the absolute best day of your life because Jesus Christ raised from the dead and set us free from all of our sin and all our pain in our life. And God is there with us always. You know, I read a post uh, recently that I wanted to share with you. I felt it was very appropriate for the day. And um, I wanted you to hear it. It says, The very first Easter was not in a crowded worship space with singing and praising. On the very first Easter, the disciples were locked in their house. It was dangerous for them to come out. They were afraid. 
They wanted to believe the good news they, they heard from the women, uh, that Jesus had risen, but it seemed too good to be true. They were living in a time of such despair and fear. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? If they left their homes, their lives and the lives of the ones they loved might be at risk. Could a miracle really have happened? Could life really have won over death? Could this time of terror and fear really be coming to an end? Alone in their homes, they dared to believe that hope was possible, that the long night was over and morning had broken, that God's love was the most powerful of all, even though it didn't seem quite real yet. Eventually, they were able to leave their homes when the fear of danger had subsided. They went around celebrating and spreading the good news that Jesus was risen and love was the most powerful force on the earth. This year, we might get to experience a taste of what that first Easter was like. Still in our homes, daring to believe that hope is on the horizon. Then after a while, when it's all safe for everybody to come out, when it is the most loving choice, we will come out, gather together, singing and shouting the good news that God brings life even out of death and that love is victorious. This year, we might get the closest taste we have ever had to that very first Easter. Now, I don't know the author of that, but it seems so appropriate that here we are sheltered in our homes, away from everyone else, things are very unusual, and yet we're celebrating Easter together. Sandy Patty sings a song uh, titled, Was It a Morning Like This? And it comes to mind on a, today, on a day like today, and I encourage you to, to check it out um, on YouTube, find it where it has the lyrics so you can read them. The first line says, Was it a morning like this? When the sun, S-O-N, still hid from Jerusalem, and Mary rose from her bed to tend to the Lord she thought was dead. I think about that song nearly every Easter, um, especially um, early on Easter morning when we're getting up and preparing for worship. Um, when, when, I, when I truly believe that all creation was awakened by this Creator rising from the dead to take away our sins, and the chorus of the song says, did the grass sing? Did the earth rejoice to feel you again? And I just, I just wonder what an incredible uh, visual of what Easter is about, where all creation that was all made by the hands of Jesus Himself starts rejoicing at His resurrection. And I can't get that image out of my head. But now I'm getting a little ahead of myself because we're going to work up to resurrection and all today. So I want us to start today by looking in Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all have an account of the resurrection story. And we're going to look at Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10 today. We're beginning in verse 1, which says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, probably the mother of James and John, went to look at the tomb. Now, I want you to get the picture of this. Um, it is dark. It is a very dark Sunday morning. Dark because it's early, but it's also dark because there has been a lingering darkness just hanging over all of them since Friday, since the crucifixion. The, t the scriptures tell us that when Christ was crucified, the whole uh, sky turned dark and blackness covered the earth. Now, Max Licato wrote a book called He Still Moves Stones, and he writes in one of those chapters, it was dark with Peter's denial, dark with the disciples' betrayal, dark with Pilate's cowardice, dark with Christ's anguish, dark with Satan's glee. Man, do we ever understand darkness and the gloom that comes with, with darkness. We are living in uncertainty, relegated to our homes, vacations canceled, jobs lost or, or furloughed or paused, Entertainment is halted. Gatherings are shut down. We understand darkness. We tune into the news each night and we hear about how many new uh, cases are out there, how many, um, how many more deaths there are. D 
darkness hovers over the face of the earth, especially during this time of pandemic. But Mary and Mary, they're dealing with it too. They're dealing with the deep sadness, and depression, and disillusionment, and anxiety. They were scared and they were worried, much like many uh, people are today. But then they got up early on that dark Sunday morning. And sometimes you want to look between the, the lines of the Scripture and just go, why? What motivated them? Why, you know, when, when you're un, in depression or you're under this cloud of darkness, you just want to stay in bed. You want to pull the covers up and just forget it. But they didn't. They didn't know it was the first Easter. They, did, they didn't have the hope that the tomb was vacated. They had forgotten all about that. They didn't even realize that. They aren't discussing uh, what they're going to uh, do when they see Jesus, what their response will be. They have absolutely no idea that the tomb is empty. Absolutely none. There was a time, though, when they were following Christ that they dared to dream. They dared to dream of Him being the Messiah and Him being the Deliverer and Him being the one that would set all things right. But not now, not this morning, not that first Easter morning. Lakato writes these words. He says, It's too late for the incredible to them. The feet that walked on water had been pierced. The hands that healed lepers had been stilled. Noble aspirations had been spiked into Friday's cross. Mary and Mary have come to place warm oils on a cold body and bid farewell to the one man who gave hope and reason for their hope. So why in the world did they get up that dark morning? Well, I believe it was, it was out of duty. Plain and simple. They got up and went because they were supposed to. It was something they needed to do. It was their devotion to someone they love. They expected nothing in return. They are not going to the tomb uh, to receive anything. No teaching, no healing, no anything. They went to give an act of love and devotion to Jesus. You know, there are times when we too are called to love, expecting nothing in return. Times when we are expected to give money to people who will never say thanks, to forgive those who will never forgive us, to come early and to stay late when no one else will notice. Service prompted by duty. That's called discipleship. It's what it means to follow Christ. It's to do something because it's the right thing to do and because we're motivated by love. Mary and Mary thought they were alone, but God was watching. Can you imagine the smile on His face knowing what they were about to experience? They're walking with heavy hearts and wondering all these questions about who will move the stone and all these things, and they have no idea that God is watching the entire time. It makes me wonder if God is smiling right now during this pandemic, during the time where we are isolated, because we don't know what He's up to. We don't know how He is going to intervene in our lives, the experience that we're going to have with the risen Christ even today, and how He is going to speak into us. He had a surprise waiting for them, and they had no idea. Verse 2-4 through four says this, There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Now that's pretty incredible. I'm sure that if this happened while they were walking, they felt the earth move. They felt the rumble and maybe even heard it. So let me ask another question. Why did the angel move the stone? I mean, for whom did he roll away the rock? Was it for Jesus? Did the, did the stone um, have to be removed in order for Jesus to get out? I mean, did God have to have help? 
I don't think so. I don't think that was it at all. The text gives a, the impression that Jesus was already out of the tomb before the stone was moved. Nowhere in the Gospels are we told that the angels moved the stone so Jesus could get out, so he could escape. Listen to what the angel said. It gives us our clue in verses 5 and 6. It says, The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Past tense. The stone was not moved for Jesus to get out but for the women to see in, for the guards to see that it was empty, for us to know that He is not there. Verse 7 and 8 says, Then He tells them, Then go quickly and tell His disciples He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see Him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell His disciples. Can you imagine the smiles on their faces? I bet they were grinning from ear to ear. I mean, just the anxiousness, the excitement, it's the thrill of all this stuff. Probably the same grins that they had on their face when they were watching him feed the 5,000 and they kept seeing those five loaves and two fish just keep producing and producing and producing out of those baskets as they were just overflowing. And all of a sudden, their old passions just flamed, uh, in, burst into flames and came to life again. Suddenly, it's all right to dream again. Suddenly, everything they had hoped for is resurrected as well, and they are looking to the future again. God is still watching them. And it's like, it's like He has said something like, I can't wait any longer. They came this far to see me. I'm going to, I'm going to go and meet them. I've got to step in there and see them because they have been so devoted and so loving. They were coming to see me this morning. And verses 9 and 10 tell us this. It says, Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him and they clasped his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Man, God does that to the faithful. He drops in on us. He shows up in our time of need. He meets us along the way. And He surprises us with His presence. I wonder if we have eyes to see Him today, to realize that we are growing closer than ever. We have prayed maybe more than we ever have because of the circumstances of our world around us. We are spending more time uh, reuniting His family and worshiping the same God together as we do today. His words, do not be afraid are His words for us this Easter. There, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to dream. Don't be afraid to hope. Don't be afraid to trust in Jesus. Don't be afraid to live or to believe or to love. Don't be afraid because I am the resurrected Lord. I have defeated death. I have overcome darkness. I have overcome depression. And I have come to meet you right where you are. When I was in college, I sang in a traveling music ministry, and we had a song we did um, by the Gaithers, I believe. It was called, He Will Carry You. And the words were, There is no problem too big, God cannot solve it. There is no mountain too tall, God cannot move it. There is no storm too dark, God cannot calm it. There is no sorrow too deep, God cannot soothe it. And the chorus says, if he carried the weight of the world on his shoulders, I know, my brother, my sister, that he will carry you. And that's exactly what he did. On Friday, he laid the burdens of the world upon his own shoulders, the sin of the world, yours and mine and all the world. And on Sunday, he put them away. He overcame them all on a morning like this. Was it? Was it a morning like this? Probably more than we realize. But I want you to look. Look into that empty 
tomb. He's no longer there. We serve a risen Savior, and He's in the world today. And that means it's all right to dream. Jesus has got this, and He's got you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for meeting us on the road. Thank you for coming into our space and into our homes today. And Father, we celebrate your resurrection. We celebrate our new birth. Lord, give us the power and the love to follow you and to trust you every step of the way. For your name is glorious, and we give all, all praise and honor to you. Holy Father, meet us where we are today and draw us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As you make your way to where you have your bread and juice for communion, I just ask you to prepare your hearts as we come together. Uh, the table in your house is now uh, the Lord's table as we gather for um, this special time together on Easter Sunday. So I want to invite you uh, as we come to uh, offer up um, prayers of confession. And we have a confession that is a part of our liturgy. And uh, the words will be on the screen if you want to join me in that as we pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you take just a moment to Think of the ways that you need Christ to forgive you, the things that you need to cleanse your heart and offer up to Him as we pause just for a moment of silence together. In 1 John 1, 9, uh, it says, uh, if, we are, if we will confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It's what happened on Friday and what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. In Luke's uh, letter, in his gospel, uh, the 22nd chapter, it says these wor words in verse 19. It says, when Jesus was around the table, he... Um, after taking the cup, he gave thanks, and he offered up the bread. He said, uh, he gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the verse 20, he says, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. And he reminds us that every time we break bread and we take the cup in remembrance of him, he is there in our midst. And so as we consecrate these elements that are before us to the Lord, um, I ask you, maybe the head of your house or whoever you are, just to raise your hand over the elements in your place and pray along in your hearts in this prayer. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and make these gifts of bread and wine. Uh, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. In our house, we are going to break the bread and take by intention. If you are uh, going to take it alone, you may take the bread and partake in this way. So, the body of Christ broken for you, the body of Christ broken for you, the body of Christ broken for you, the body of Christ broken for me, the blood of Christ shed for you, Amen. the blood of Christ shed for you, the blood of Christ 
shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for me. It's the custom in the early church that after they would receive a communion, they would sing a hymn. We're not going to do that. But it would say, <laughs> to pass the peace of Christ, which means to embrace each other with the love of Christ. And so as we part today, I invite you to embrace those around you. If you don't have someone present with you, then give, them a, give a friend a call on the phone or a loved one. Tell them that Christ is risen and that you love them and you embrace them as well. So now go forth in peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all until we meet again. Amen. And until next week, goodbye. Happy Easter.